Welcome, everybody. Uh, today's little seminar on Life Insurance 101, basically the concept here is they said yes and now what? So for some of you experienced people, this will be a, a, a great uh, recap uh, for, for folks that are new to the life insurance business. This is a uh, part of the uh, process you need to be successful uh, out there in the marketplace. So a little bit about us, for those that you don't know, uh, we're just a, a platform based on helping PNC agencies Try to solve their clients' needs through the use of life insurance uh, and uh, significantly growing the revenue of their agency by by selling these products because the margin is so much higher on them than uh, traditional PNC products, and it also helps your retention uh, when you sell a life insurance policy to your to your customer. The team here, uh, myself, Brad Sorensen, Justin Valenzuela, and David Hollingsworth, have uh, well, it's getting it's be, getting close pretty close to a century of of uh, knowledge between. Uh, David, Brad, and I, and then you add you throw Justin in there. It's probably put, put uh, puts us up over a, a century for sure, about of a hundred years of uh, experience teaching people uh, how to sell life insurance uh, from their agencies. In this slide, I like to put in the training sessions just to remind you. So, if you're an experienced person learning this, and you and you're wondering why you're here, or maybe what you're going to get out of this. Remember that for some reason in adult education, we always think that if we show somebody something one time, that that information sticks with them. And if you look at the red line, that's really what your learnings look like after you go to a single session. And if you go to a session multiple times, over time, you're, if you follow the green line, your trajectory is, of knowledge is, is much higher. And that, that's what it looks like for you as, an, uh, as a, a professional developing in the insurance business. But it also looks that way for a client, and we often forget about that when we start interacting with our customers. We talk, we tell them something at the first meeting, and then by the time we place the insurance policy, that information, they, they don't remember it. So my challenge here to you is remember that you have to keep showing it to them over and over again. So I'm going to show you some concepts today that are intertwined with, with previous sections of what we've, we've taught you. And the idea there is that you have to keep telling your client, you have to keep showing your client because they won't remember because their knowledge falls pretty far off after that first meeting where you showed them how term insurance works or what their need was or something of that of that nature. So this is a continuation of the last two seminars we did. We did a seminar on how to prospect for life insurance and we did one for solving for the need. And right here uh, today's sessions on closing the sale. And then the next session we'll do is on how to place, get, make sure your case gets placed. So the question, the first thing is, are you asking the question? Warren, I just told my staff this morning, there's a reason that State Farm is one of the largest riders of life insurance. And they just do one simple thing. They, they're the probably least experienced in the business. But the one thing they do and they're trying to do is ask. Yeah. Interesting. Anybody else? Yeah, Warren, I can confirm that we have an uh, RMA in our office. It came from State Farm um, as a CRS, and uh, she always said that you know they asked. Yeah, so. so the reality is, if you don't ask the, que uh, the the question, the answer is always what? No. 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 Right. It, it, uh, you know, if you don't uh, try, you will always fail. Right. And so, if you don't act, you will always justify why you did that. You know, it's a it's a funny story. Many of you that know me, many of you that don't know me, I got to play football in college and, and, I, and I got to play football because I answered an ad in the newspaper. Literally, I was reading the newspaper. There's an advertisement for to try out for the football team. And I went out there for the tryout and I ended up making the team and got to play. And I got to I actually lettered in football, which was a very big deal. Right. And I've talked to a lot of people over my life that that know me from my football days and will say, you know, I thought about trying out, but, and, and it's funny because they always come to me and justify why they didn't try out, right? And so the, the key to this whole thing is that if you want to be successful in the life, life insurance business, you have to act, right? You have to start asking those questions. You, and and if, if, if you don't ask, the answer is always going to be no anyways. And all I can tell you is no, it doesn't hurt. So it's just, that's kind of the, the, the backbone to being successful in, in, in this business. So your client is ready now, right? Uh, and today what we're gonna we're gonna go over is you know you presenting your solution, some techniques for closing, 
managing buyer's remorse up front because a lot of times you, you you'll place a case and they'll cancel it in the in the in the free look period or they'll cancel it a year in or whatever. We want to make sure you set that set the stage so the policy doesn't cancel. And then we'll talk about some uh, uh, best practices for actually taking the application. So when you present your solution, you have to kind of look at things along this continuum. Um, and it's it's kind of twofold here when I'm trying to illustrate two things to you, right? So I've got term at the top of the list because most of the time, if you're asking a question to a, to a client, hey, I, I've closed your, your home and car insurance today. I'm just curious who has your life insurance. I'm just curious if you died in a car wreck on the way home from the work, what's your plan? Some some question like that to get the, the conversation going. Term is going to solve that problem because you're solving for a need and it's probably a person that 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 doesn't already have life insurance or something in place. And then you, you go down to the bottom of the spectrum where it's permanent insurance or you could do some combination of, of term, and, uh, term and perm. But you need to remember when you look over at this investment period on the uh, uh, pyramid on the right hand side that down there in the foundation of a person's financial plan, protection is the critical part. And if you if you present a permanent solution, many customers will bite will, will, will jump on to that idea because they like the idea that it's not it doesn't ever cancel if you pay the premium. The policy is going to be there and it builds cash value, but then it becomes unaffordable and they don't they won't buy enough because of the affordability or they won't they won't buy any because they don't like the fact that term insurance doesn't have a, a cash value component or something of that nature. So remember that when you're in this space we're talking about today, that protection is the most critical thing. So don't worry that term insurance might be solving. 90, 95 percent of your deals and the other five to 10 percent or some kind of combination are permanent. And, you know, uh, if, in my space as a, as a wealth advisor helping people, I put permanent life insurance up at the top closer between growth and diversification and speculation. So the reason I do that is because that's when they have all the other things in the bottom part of their pyramid satisfied, then I'm going to say, hey, it's time to to use another investment vehicle, which is permanent life insurance. If they have the cash flow to solve the protection need and the additional growth and diversification, then sell them the permanent policy right now. That's that's what I'm what I'm, I'm telling you. But don't be afraid that or, or get some mindset that term insurance is bad because your goal with these kind of techniques that we're going to teach you is to solve the protection need first. And then later on, we'll get into the advanced uh, topics of talking about how do we sell uh, to someone that has has money and why would they use life insurance as one of their investment vehicles? All right. So closing best practices, right? So um, the first thing you have to do, and remember that chart I showed you about repetitive can, uh, continuous learning, is summarize the solution for agreement. I'm presenting this proposal. This is what you said you needed. Blah 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 blah. And make sure the customer agrees that that's what they wanted. Get that agreement up front. So many people will go to the application and the customer doesn't want to tell you no at that point. They'll go through the whole work of taking the application. And then when you try to collect money, they'll balk. Or when you try to deliver the policy and collect money, they'll balk. You, you could, you, by not getting that agreement up front, you're jeopardizing not being able to place the case at some uh, point in the future. All right. And then the next point there is to always tie the solution back to their reason for purchasing. Um, for years I've been doing this and I would recommend it to every one of you. When, when the policy comes in, I, I always have them delivered to me. I stick a cover page on it and I and bold letters I type out and print it off the computer what the reason was for buying it. Jimmy's college fund, Susie's final expense money. Think of the things you could put on there so that when they Think about stop paying it. They go to that file, they pull that policy out, and right on top, it's reminding them why they bought the policy. But when you're, so that's how I deliver it. But when I'm there closing the policy, I always remind them why we're doing this. And it's, it's a simple technique, right? right? So this, isn't this going to be great that we're funding Jimmy's college fund? Isn't this great that we're not going to burden the family with grandma's uh, final expenses. 
think think of the ways you can you can what you can say to make them remember why they're buying the policy because when you leave, they forget very, very quickly, as I've showed you on that that learning chart. And two months later, six months later, your policy will lapse because they can't remember why they bought it. And you got to tell them that over and over again. So make sure you reinforce the benefits that are relevant to them. You know, the best company that you, the, the insurance company you chose, uh, right? So whether it's Nationwide or, or uh, some other insurance company that you like to use that's your best company, tell them why this is my best company. I like this company because their rates are, are affordable. Uh, I've got good underwriting support. They're AM best, A rated. They've been in the life insurance business since 1929, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, tell that story so that they know that you're putting them with a quality company. You, you need to remind them about the timing that it will take to put this policy in place, right? What, what the next steps are, what's going to happen, about the fact that this is your peace of mind, your protection, that's what we're putting in place. That you're here for them, right? You, if they have any questions, don't don't be afraid to call me. There's no stupid questions in this business. You know, I've been doing this for 30 plus years, and I still get questions I can't answer on a daily basis. So most customers' questions, from my opinion or perspective, are pretty smart. If that's the case, just asking the group, you know, a little feedback here. You know, Sam, I can see you because you were the last person talked on my screen. What's your go-to? Well, you know, how do you how do you when you get there and you kind of sense the customer's ready to, to close, what do you say? You know, basically, my go-to is that um, we'll go back to the original reason why we're there, tell them how it's going to benefit them, and tell them to try to understand how important part of this, uh, whether it's a, you know, life insurance policy, a long-term care rider on it, whether it's a, with waiver premium on it, whatever benefits that this life insurance is going to provide for them. I review that with them and just get an agreement that this is why we're doing what we're doing. Because you had a need for this, because when our last discussion, you brought up the point that I'm worried about these years, or I'm worried about after those years. Yeah. So whatever concerns it, <clears throat> he has, that's my, you know, cl closing best practices, reminding him of why he wanted me to uh, uh, write insurance for him. Makes makes sense. Anybody else have a, a, a go to that they use? Warren, I always try to use a personal, you know, issue that has happened. You know, I've been in this business 30 years, too, and paid a lot of death claims. But I'm but I'm always saying, you know, I, I commend you for making this, you know, this decision to, to protect your family, to put little Johnny through college, whatever it is, you know, that kind of reminds me of situation I had, you know, with one of our clients and, you know, in a true story, we, we had a, a guy that we, we wrote coverage on that worked, uh, he worked at the funeral home and we wrote the coverage for him at the funeral home. Young guy just got married. And unfortunately, while he was working at the funeral home, they were not busy and he took the buddy's motorcycle out for a spin and never come back. But I always try to say, you know, the, that family there never thought they would you know, need need that coverage, but you know, I always commend you for making the big step. Protect your family. Interesting. Anybody else? So I'll, I'll just give you some examples. Um, you know, sometimes people will tell you, um, "I need to think about it." Right. One of my lines or one of my closing techniques is, "Is would you like to be covered while you're thinking about it?" And they'll say, well, what do you mean? Say, well, I can put a conditional receipt in place. We can process the application and, and you'll have the coverage while you're thinking about it. Once the company makes an offer, then you can decide whether you want to uh, continue the policy or not. Warren, I, I usually do that. Um, you know, if you're not 100% convinced that you want to do this or not, I also try to say, let's apply for the maximum, whether you're undecided, whether you want 100, 150, 200, yep. let's apply for 250. I and like this it. way, we get you applied, we get the company's um, decision, and then we can go from there. Then we'll find an amount that fits your budget, fits your situation, and it's gonna take 30 days or so. So let's get this done and we could eat. If you wanna pay on it now, you're covered conditionally. So you're not out any, any money, you're not losing anything, but God forbid if something happened to you, you're covered. Yeah. Um, 
I think this is Justin's go to here uh, and I'll let him share how, how he, he, he likes to use this one. So this is uh, this is kind of co combining uh, what uh, a little bit of what uh, Sam said, but go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll take that one, Warren. So I think this is really based on, I think, 75 percent of uh, the population overestimate the cost of life insurance. So it's kind of get gauging where the client is. So this is directly after. Uh, determining a need, whether you use uh, DIME, a dime, or LIFE, whatever you come up with a need. So I would say, okay, Warren, based on the the, the form that you filled out, it looks like your family has a need of about $1.2 million worth of life insurance. So tell me, Warren, how much do you think that costs on a monthly basis? Oh, uh, I think it costs about uh, $200 a month, probably. $200 a month. Okay. So if the if if the cost was two hundred dollars a month, what does your budget look like? How much of that two hundred dollars a month could you afford? I've actually only got about seventy five bucks. Seventy five bucks up to about what would be your max? Yeah, I could stretch it maybe to a hundred. We're just pretty tight at the house. Two hundred, yeah, that makes sense. All right, so what I think we should do is we'll submit. Uh, as you know, it's not your money that qualifies you; it's your health. So let's go ahead and submit some applications. Uh, let's get an indication back from the carriers of what you qualify for. Uh, the best, and then we'll come back and, and try to fit something within your budget. Oh, okay, cool. So again, it's like just it. using, yeah, it's just using kind of uh, what their what their thought process is, and then regurgitating it back to them. And then again, we haven't talked about any specific product um, type. We're just kind of getting an indication of what their uh, their budget is. That's a great idea, Justin. So you basically apply. You 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 can kind of come back to that that product feature. So that in that case, you could sell them. If they if 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 a hundred bucks would give them some permanent and term yep. insurance, you might be able to solve solve the, the longer problem for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. Warren. When I I try to find out how much they can afford, um, one of the things I use is if I told you that all of this coverage that we're talking about the max cost a hundred bucks a month, could you afford that? Oh yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I said, well, if I told you it cost $500 a month, what would you say? Oh, man, no, nah, that, that's too high. I wouldn't spend that kind of money. Okay, so we're looking for something between $100 a month and $500 a month that's going to fit your budget, that's going to solve your needs. So I'll go and I'll prepare some stuff and we'll we'll go from there. And I've really never had anybody to say, oh, well, I, I don't want to spend any more than 100 bucks a month. Yeah, they sort of let that range go because they know they're they they really don't want to say they can't afford it, and they really don't want to come out and say, "Well, I could afford four hundred dollars." You know, I they like just that. don't want to say almost anything. Yeah, that's at a, that point, that's a great technique, Sam, because yeah. you're basically setting it up. So when you go back to them, you can bring them a hundred dollar solution. Maybe it's straight term insurance. You can bring them a four hundred dollar solution that might be straight permanent insurance. And you're gonna you're 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 gonna you're gonna sell a policy somewhere in between that range, and you'll you'll have a great solution for that client. That's an awesome idea. This one goes back to what you said a minute ago, Sam. Let's submit for the max need and see what they offer. But let's let's apply for the most, and let's see what kind of offer we get back because 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 the price could change based on your health, right? It's it's not you know these rates I'm illustrating for you. They're just illustrations. They don't really mean thing until you qualify for the insurance, right? So this is the idea. Remember that rates can vary from A to Z, right? And and I I always tell clients that look that rate you're seeing on television, that's an A plus 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 rate. A very small percentage of the of the population qualifies for that, and you know it, it actually goes from uh, to Z and then decline where people don't even qualify for the insurance. And and so you have that conversation with them right up front. And the reason we do this in the closing process is because if you get a rate back from the carrier that's got a table rating or a flat extra or some kind of pricing mechanism to it, you'll be able to place the case because you can say, good news, your table B. You know, that's not, whoa, that's not bad. They he told me it was A to Z and I'm a, I'm a table B. Awesome. I mean, I didn't think, sometimes the client will say, I didn't think they were going to give me the insurance because I have, because I, I have X. They think they're uninsurable, right? But if you tell them up front, it's A plus 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 for the most healthiest person on the planet to to Z or and then decline, and you deliver a table D, right? They go, well, I'm still I'm pretty good. So um, 
that that's the way you, and you always set that up in that in that application interview um, um, that you're doing right now, you know, in this meeting where you're closing the policy. So they understand when you come back from underwriting with a table ready case. And I want to be honest with the group. I've never had a table kit, a table ready case that I did in place. In 30 years, because I use this statement up front and I tell them they qualify for the insurance, their family history, their their personal medical history and and their physical attributes is going to qualify them for the insurance. I've never had a table ready case not place. Because I told them up front, that's what could happen. And so, so many times, if you if you show them that A plus plus rate, and then you come back with that table rated policy and didn't explain up front, they're mad or frustrated with you because they think you bait and switched them, that you, you you changed the deal on them. All right. So that's where I go here. You know, I've got great news, right? Uh, based on what you what you've told me today. You should qualify for a, a a jet issue policy. I mean, you guys, when you get a little experience in this, Sam knows this. If you sit down with somebody, they answer no to all the application questions, and and they're 28 years old or 35 years old. You can pretty much say, I'm I'm based on what you've told me. I think this thing is going to fly right through underwriting on a jet issue, right? So unless something's uh, uh, you you haven't disclosed to me comes up in your uh, background. You should be good to uh, good to go. So, yeah, uh, um, Warren. One yeah. thing I, I started years ago was before I even do a proposal, I sit down with the client and ask them his medical history. Yeah, and and I want to get that down on a piece of paper, get the problems, get how often, get his A one C, get what kind of cancer, what degree, how often, hospitalization. And then I'll say I'm going to use this information because we've got a lot of of, of health insurance um, levels, and I want to get this information so that when I come back to you and say the underwriter thinks that you're going to be around this type of an underwriting decision, you might be standing on tobacco. So I'll show them standing on tobacco, and I say if you're better, we'll go up one. If you're worse, we're going to go down one. Yeah, or down two, depending. So that's why I, I don't want to come in and say this is where this is preferred, and then walk in with a, with a rated case because you didn't. We found out that you had a history, you know, uh, of bronchitis. So you had a you know history of asthma, or whatever is going to turn it away. So I try to do that up front, and I've always been pretty successful at either getting a higher classification, but pretty pretty good at what I what I ask for. Because yeah. I get that medical information up front and do a proposal and tell yeah. them, hey, listen, you got to be honest with me. If you're hiding something, they're going to find it and you're going to get whacked for it. Yep. And that the the great thing about our partnership with Nationwide, and, and they're wonderful with this on this, is we've got a line into the chief actuary or I'm sorry, chief uh, underwriter. And literally, if you give us you send Brad kind of those case uh, parameters. He'll tell you what what uh, based on that information. This is what I think we can issue it at. Hey, hey Warren, so, just a quick just a quick sidebar. One of Justin's producers asked a question during the sales meeting yesterday. She provided me the more meeting the information this morning. I just got a reply back. Basically, he said I suggest taking the application and give us the opportunity to underwrite. Uh, nothing about that makes me think that we can't be able to come up with an offer. So that my turnaround on that, I sent it. At twelve sixteen, I got a reply back at two twenty one. Yeah, that that that's pretty cool. And in this particular case, the the guy is a disabled veteran. Right. He was disabled jumping out of an airplane, which he's got a, a knee or a back issue. It's not life threatening, but most people that think they're on disability can't qualify for insurance. When we approached the client, our producer did the client the the client said, "Well, I can't qualify for for insurance. I need it, but I can't qualify for it." So she asked some questions about. You know what's the disability about? We got that information, shared it with Nationwide Underwriting Team, and they came back and said we can get that case issued for you. So, um, so remember when you're doing this that people buy on emotion. Um, they, you know, and, and it's really easy when we're selling a life insurance policy to get mired or or tied up in the facts, right? The facts of the illustration, the details of the illustration. And you've got to always bring it back to that emotional part. part. So your passion 
about the product or about the solution is going to stir up uh, their emotion. If you're passionate about how life insurance works and how you've delivered a life insurance check, or if, you, if you're young to the business and don't know that, talk to Sam or me or Brad or somebody who's delivered a life, uh, Justin has delivered a life insurance check. Take our story and use it. You can say we, you can say our, you can, you don't say I delivered a life insurance check. You can say, you know, there's, when we deliver uh, uh, death, death checks from our office, this is what normally happens. People are grateful or, or thankful. And I tell the story all the time that we're the only people that show up with a check. We truly are in a noble business. And you, you all should realize this. Everyone else in your time of need is asking for money. The priest, the preacher, the rabbi, whoever it is, ask for money to bury your family member. They, they need money to do that. The person, who, the, the person who interns them and puts them in a casket and all that, that all costs money, right? And you're the only guy that shows up to the funeral with a check. And I'm not saying that money can replace a human being. That's not what I'm saying. But it sure solves a lot of problems that are created when one of our souls leaves this planet. So you can hear that passion in my voice right there, right? <laughs> so if you're passionate about it, that's going to bring that emotion to the top of the table and get those, those customers to understand why they need to do this, right? Get them involved in their needs and wants. You know, you really want your kid to be able to go to college if something happens to you. I think that's really admirable because I know parents who have died and their kid didn't go to college. I mean, Shelby, my daughter, was in here the other day and she said something about one of her friends. And she said, that's the kid you offered to pay for his college because his parents passed away. You know, so that 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 stuff happens. You you guys know these stories all around you. You've got to do that. And then you you got to have this conviction that makes you convincing. You got to believe in this stuff because if you don't, they'll smell it on you like like BO, like body odor, and they won't want to buy from you. Right. So facts tell, stories sell. Remember that. All right. And remember that the emotion doesn't go away once the application is taken. You've got to remove the uncertainty from them. You've got to put that protection in place that it's going to solve that problem when somebody leaves the planet. Kind of this idea is selling the needs. You applicate, you take the application with your underwriting, and then you solve on what they qualify for, right? And you, you've got to set the stage early, as I keep telling you, that it's not your decision. It's not the insurance carrier's decision. It's their, their issues that are creating the rate. It's their health, their family history, their physical attributes that determine whether the policy gets placed or not. You know, and I start that, I start that those conversations early on in the discussion as Sam talked to you guys about it, finding out, hey, what's going on? Why did, why did you respond so easily when I asked you if you wanted to buy life insurance? Usually people that do that might have a health problem that, and, and now they know they need life insurance because people always want to buy this when it's too late. And usually if you ask the question kind of that way, they'll say, well, my friend just passed away. My brother's uh, wife passed away. They'll give you some reason why life insurance is on the top of their mind. If they're a quick, if they say yes, or they bite very fast on your bait of asking them a question, right? So checking all the boxes, right? You found the client, you learn their story, you create a relationship, you propose the best solution for them, right? You guys do all this part. I mean, some of you find the client and some of you go right to proposing the best solution. Remember, you got to learn their story. You got to ask them questions and learn about them. You just can't close that policy down, right? You have to create a relationship. People buy from people they trust and like. Sometimes you can be trusted and not liked and you won't sell the policy. Other times you can be liked, but not trusted. People tell me all the time, Warren, that's impossible. And I say, really, let's go interview uh, a young person in our world. And I'll say, hey, Shelby, my daughter. Hey, Shelby, um, would you let this friend of yours, so-and-so, watch your, your dog, Max? Oh, never. Well, why? Well, I don't trust him. But they're your friend. Yeah, I like them, Dad, but I don't trust them. So you all have those situations, right? So think about that with your client. If you don't close the deal, my guess is there's no relationship there. We have a, a he's a middle aged middle middle producer today. We we hired him in our, our agency about 10, 12 years ago. 
and and he used to come in and he'd say, I lost this deal or whatever. And I'd say, well, well, Luke, you don't have any relationship with the client. And he'd be like, no, Warren. And I'd go, Luke, if they didn't buy from you, it's because they don't trust you and or they don't like you. Which means you don't have a relationship. So always remember that. Don't put the cart before the horse. Horse, you've got the client, you've learned their story, you've created a relationship, and you propose the best solution for them. Never ever propose the best solution for your pocketbook. Always the best solution for them. Right? And don't apply your economic situation to their solution. Just because you can't afford a $400 a month life insurance policy doesn't mean they can't afford a $400 a month life insurance uh, policy. Produce and propose the best solution for their situation. Let them decide what they want to buy. Don't decide for them. What is buyer's remorse? They forget the real reason why they just bought it. That's exactly right, Kevin. I mean, and how many times has this happened to you on a life insurance case? Oh, it's happened several times, but early on. Yeah. Anybody else? Is, is, is there a new producer on, on, on here that got a policy 10-day free look? Are canceled in the first 30 days or 60 days, and you got a big back charge to your commission statement? Hi, Ms. Warren. I don't sell, but I'm a part of the backside process. So I've definitely seen some clients that were excited to do the application. I submitted it, and then I'll get a call from an agent, from the agent, or an email from the client saying, Oh, I've changed my mind. Um, you know, I've got other things going on, and it, you know, they just kind of disappear. So this definitely happens often, even in the underwriting process in that limbo kind of space it does that occurs it, too yeah it does and so you kind of you kind of see some of the techniques that i said you know about being covered while the application's there making yep. sure you have a relationship with them they the customer probably forgot why they bought the policy there exactly. wasn't enough reinforcement in the reason for buying the policy yep. you know and you know if it's a final expense situation you know, I, I, I remind people, do you want to have to use uh, GoFundMe to pay for your grandma's funeral? That's what we all know. We, we all are in communities with friends who are all donating to their loved ones' funerals. Yep. Why, why are we doing we, we should donate to their loved one's life insurance policy a, a couple pennies and leverage it to pay for the funeral. It's an interesting, uh, I mean, maybe we should start that on GoFundMe. Hey, I don't want to hit you up in a couple of years when my mom dies, so I'm hitting you up now. Can you give me a dollar <laughs> instead of a hundred dollars in a couple of years to pay for my mom's life insurance policy? <laughs> so that <laughs> you guys are exactly right about what this buyer's remorse thing is, and, and it's a it's a big thing in our industry because con consumers forget why they bought it. They feel like the salesperson or the agent uh, coerced them or convinced them to, to buy the policy, so they'll they'll back out in the middle of the process or. Uh, it's better off when they do it in underwriting so you don't you don't get a back charge. When they do it three months in or six months in, you typically get a nice back charge on your on your commission statement, which is never fun to digest. Hey Warren, before you leave that, we're gonna go back at the bottom of there when we were looking this up, I think it's interesting. Justin talked about that phenomenon that's really hard to change people's mind that they think life insurance is gonna be expensive, right? Yeah. So buyer's remorse kicks in when it, they perceive it's something expensive they're buying and or it's unfamiliar and most people aren't very familiar with life. So to some degree, life insurance can bring both of those to the table at the same time. You're exactly right. Great, yeah, great, uh, one, great point. I'm sorry, one, one thing I do, I talk about this uh, with my clients. I say, listen, you know, I don't want you to go to go to sleep tomorrow, tonight and get up in the middle of the night and say, oh, you know, I don't think I made the right decision. I said, you know, that that's no, not that, gonna do you or me any good. I said, I want you to be able to lay your head on a pillow at night and feel good that you have taken care of a concern and a problem that you have and that your situation is better off because we did this. Yeah. So that's a you know. that's a great that's a great uh, setup for, for not for not letting them have buyer's remorse, which leads into this next thing. Right. So first thing you got to do about buyer's remorse is recognize the cause. Right. What what causes this is people think they spent too much money or they think it's too fancy uh and, and they can't afford it or whatever right deliver your value meet the customer's expectations provide timely responses to them go the extra mile and uh know your customer right and re keep reaffirming their decision and then show appreciation for the fact that they were smart enough to solve this problem that you you're 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 you know you're in an elite crowd 
by, by taking care of this this solution for your for your family. So the next thing goes on to, to preparation. Um, and, and this is about you all being prepared. And, and the question I would have is, have you sold a policy to yourself? You know, and, and it, it's hard to sell something that you don't have on yourself and you haven't gone through the process uh, at your company to know what that process is like. Um, if you already have life insurance, then walk th walk through the process with somebody else so you see it step by step by step. Um, have you taken a practice application? And have you, have you looked at all the forms um, and papers, whether, whether they're paper or electronic? I mean, so many times I see agents, they'll go out with the application, and when they're in the interview, the customer will say, yes, I, I jump out of airplanes. Yes, I'm a pilot. And then you don't have the hazardous activity questionnaire with you, so you go back home and you have to go back to the client and now they've got buyer's remorse. Take the hazardous activity questionnaire, take all the forms you might need on every case. You don't know what, when you start talking to them, when you start learning their story, you're gonna find out all kinds of things that that person does. They could race cars, they could jump out of airplanes, they could fly airplanes, they could scuba dive. I mean, we all have kind of, they could rock, you know, mountain climb, free climb, they could bungee jump. They could do all kinds of crazy stuff. Right? You know, so make sure. So don't don't let it be your first time to fill out the form or see the form when you're when you're meeting with the client. When you talked about having sold a policy, uh, my first year to at John Hancock when I started, I was talking to a client and he was sort of a little bit of a smart guy and he goes, "Yeah, do you have life insurance?" I said, "Yeah." He said, well, show me what you got. And I said, okay. I had a $250,000 life insurance policy. Da, 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 da. I don't know, it cost me $200 a month or whatever it was. He said, okay, I'll take exactly what you got. How's that? And it's like, you know, oh my God, I didn't think that was going to happen. But I had my policies with me just in case somebody would ask me, what do you got? So I don't do that anymore. But it was when I first started, it really helped me because I could show to people here, here's what I got. You know, I believe in what I'm selling. So so you, it's funny, Sam, I, I get asked all the time on larger cases when I'll be doing a buy sell agreement or something of that nature. They'll ask me and I'll be blunt with the group. I have 16 million dollars of first of my life insurance on my life. I have a big you know, I've got a, this company here that it's got to be unwound if something happens to me. I don't want it to go away. I want to make sure there's enough money to keep it uh, running and my family uh, gets their economic value out, out of the company. Um, and then I've got $2 million uh, uh, second to die, you know, sitting on a life insurance trust to potentially pay some estate taxes and things of that nature uh, mm -hmm. if, if, some, if something happens to, to both my wife and I. But when they ask me those questions and I tell them that they're because they're thinking I'm going to buy a million bucks on my buy sell agreement. And this guy just told me he's got sixteen million dollars. Maybe I don't have enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I, you know, so I'm, I'm. That's the amount of, you know, if you do the math on my situation, that's the amount of life insurance I need uh, to to unwind the mess I have. You got to think about the debt I have. They're on the business. All the things I've got that I've got that people. That, I mean, there's a, a couple hundred people counting on me to get out of bed tomorrow morning. So something's got to make sure that the 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 Warren machine keeps running, whether Warren's here or not. So have you done a pyramid on yourself, right? You got to do a pyramid on yourself so you know what it's like to be have a pyramid. Um, if, you, if you don't have a relationship with a pyramid company, you should get one and just say, look, would you come? I, I, don't, I don't need it, but would you come do, it, do the test on me so I, and show me what happens so I can understand it? They don't really need to draw blood or all that stuff. At least you walk through the process and understand what happens when you have a pyramid. And they come out to your office and do an EKG. I mean, there's, you just need to understand what that stuff looks like. Um, come prepared, uh, be thorough, bring all the applications, all the supplemental documents, and expect the unexpected. Expect them to say, hey, I forgot to tell you, I have cancer. Hey, I forgot to tell you, I've been a childhood diabetic. I mean, that, you know, Sam's been doing this a long time. I mean, there's, there's a thousand times where you, you look at this person and think they're super healthy. And then they pop the unexpected on you in the last second. And I'll, I'll give you guys a, a great example uh, of this, the unexpected. And, and it was a, a 
positive outcome, but I was talking to a client and we're going through the needs analysis and we're talking about what they 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 need. And I've asked them probably three different ways. Do they have any special needs? Any any uh, extraordinary circumstances that they would need to fund for? Nope, 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 nope. So we're talking, I'm building a relationship. And they start talking about their child. The child's got Down syndrome and is a special needs child. And they have not thought about the fact that if mom and dad are gone, that kid's going to need, a, there's going to be a lot of money set aside to make sure that that kid is properly cared for uh, to, to adulthood. Otherwise, the kid's going to be institutionalized. And that's not, the parents wouldn't have the kid at home if that's what they wanted, right? But when when somebody has a, a, a special needs kid, they don't think of them as special. Most people think of that as a blessing, that that, that, that kid's disability has made our family better, right? It's shown us a different part of life, but that, so they don't think about the economic impact or the, the financial situation that could happen if you if they passed away and now their their sister has to take care of that kid and, and what that's going to look like, right? So those are just some examples of what you'll get in, in, in an un, unexpected situation. Be diligent, get the full story, which uh, Sam has given us some great examples of how to do that. Make sure they don't uh, make a material misrepresentation. I see this with clients um, all the time where they want to lie about their tobacco usage. And you all need to know this, that people confuse the two-year contestability phase of a life insurance policy with the ability to lie on an application. If you make a material misrepresentation on, a, on an insurance contract, it lives forever. So if you tell the client, if you tell the insurance company that you do not smoke and you get a non-tobacco preferred rate and you die of lung cancer 10 years later and they can prove that you, you were a smoker at the time of the application, they're probably going to not pay the claim. They could, some carriers might pay the claim, but pay you the, but charge you the back premium you owed for being a, 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 a non-tobacco rate. Most clients think, oh, if I can get away with this lie for two years, the policy is no longer contestable and they'll get away. But you need to remember that a material misrepresentation is fraud and it voids the contract. And so don't let a client, if you know the client dips, you know the client, they're dipping while they're talking to you. You got to say, man, I can see that you dip. Yeah, let's don't tell them. And then explain to the client what a material misrepresentation is. The goal is to have the policy pay in their time of need. That this is the part most people miss miss in our business. So many of us just want to sell the policy. That's not what the deal is. The deal is to, to put something in place that will pay when they have an accident, when they die, when they become disabled, when whatever the contract says it's going to do. And you need to tell the client that's the intention here. The intention isn't to get you a cheaper price, uh, you know, by by lying to the insurance company and telling them you don't smoke. The intention is to have the damn thing pay when you die, right? And then once you get the full story, make sure you illustrate it realistically. Don't show them a non-tobacco preferred plus, plus, plus rate. Show them what, to, to Sam's point, show them a table D, show them a table B. Tell them they might be a little better, might be a little worse, okay? Old school versus new school. Doesn't matter how you do it. You know, a lot of guys will take paper applications and they do it the old school way because they want to sit down. And the tactical feeling of filling that paperwork out with the client, uh, a lot of producers believe that does something. And then the client wet signs it. It cements the deal, right? Think about other things you, you sign for your house. You know, you, you go into a closing room and you do it. It makes it more tangible, right? Um, lots of people like to use the electronic application. If you do electronic, make sure your laptop's working. Make sure you got an internet connection. Don't go over there and fumble around not knowing how to make the electronic thing work because you'll look like a fool to the customer and they'll lose all their trust for you and that'll create buyer's remorse or some other problem later a lot of guys use a combination i don't know if derek's on here i know some of his people are on here derek or maybe somebody from your team you guys paper app it in the field bring it back and electronic electronic it if i know your process is that right yes yeah, so um i'm Derek campbell's granddaughter mr warren it's nice to hey, meet man. you he yeah. talks about you a lot yeah, we're good. <laughs> um, so the process is once we have once the agent goes out to visit the client, 
they will complete the paper application and then they send it to myself and my aunt Brandy, who also works here as well. And we submit the application via um, the pipeline electronically. Yep. So it's centralized through us. We've you know pretty much memorized the full process of iPipeline, how to put everything in. So um, any kind of corrections, we catch it ahead of time, which I think is an extreme plus. So that way, if we see something that's missing, we can catch it before we submit it. So that way, there's no issues initially when we retrieve the policy number and case manager, all that good stuff. Then you send it back to the client for DocuSign to get a signature. Yes, on it. Yeah, that is sense. correct. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so the so back to my point to everybody, you can do this paper, you can do it electronic, or you can do it like the Campbell team does it, and and just do a combination uh, uh, of both of them. There's no wrong or right answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, Derek's team's got a got a process built that functions, and I'm pretty sure I know why he does it. So he can take a young agent and not have to teach him the technology, not have to have a laptop, all the things that that cost it. And so they can go out and do the paper app. They submit it, and someone who knows the system. Can get the can, can get the policy uploaded and, and into the iPipe, so it's a great great process. Thank you. So you always want to use a cover sheet with every application. This is going to make your um, cases go much better. So this is an example of a a, a, a cover sheet. The applicant's name, the agency name, home office uh, number, the pr producer name, the producer's email, the producer's phone number. And then the mailing, the mailing address, the policy needs to be mailed to. If you like to, I, I, I like to deliver policies in person because it, 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 again, reinforces the reason they bought it, Jimmy's College Fund. So when I take it to their house or I, I meet with them for a cup of coffee, um, and I, I know you guys are saying, well, man, Warren, you're doing a lot of work. I'm like, yeah, but I want to make sure the policy sticks, right? Because the last thing you want to do is pay a back charge on that, that commission, right? And then I always put comments in it, right? Applicants, 50 years old male with prior cancer history, initial detection in 2010, treated from 2010 to 2012, clean screens annually since 2013, no current medications. So I'm, I'm giving a little, little little cover story, little back little back thing to what it is. I might I you know I might tell them more about you know this is a, a business uh, buy sell agreement. There's four applications that are different names, but they're relate they're they're all related. We need to make the offers at the same time. Uh, that that would go on this cover letter. Tell them what's going on, right? And then make sure you uh, tell your story. That's the the part up front to the to the carrier. Anticipate the questions that that you're going to get from the carrier. You might ask to go ahead and have them in your back pocket, knowing that when the carrier asks you, you can answer them, or vice versa when the client asks you. And then make sure you communicate openly with the client. Hey, hey, uh, Mr. C uh, customer, I've gotten some some questions back from the insurance carrier. I told you there might be a few based on what you told me. They need uh, your doctor from 2010 to 2012. Can you give me the information on that? All right. Educate the client on the next steps. Tell them that they're, I mean, depending on, you guys know how this works today. You know, if, if the if the app is clean and it's going to jet issue, there probably won't be an interview. But if you tell them up front, there could be an interview. You could get a phone call from somebody from the insurance company verifying the information we took on the application. Maybe asking for some more detail. OK, so you might tell them the standard medical requirements based on face and age. It's a hundred thousand dollar policy. You're 25 years old. There are no medical requirements, right? They're not going to do a paramed. They're not going to do anything. It looks, you know, you, you, you looks like based on the application, you should have everything done. R remember, tell them, look, if they discover some medical information and during underwriting, they could come back and ask you questions. Don't panic. They just. There might be some medication your doctor prescribed for you that doesn't treat what you said you had. Sometimes um, you're and then, you know, I, I'll, I'll use Botox as an example, right? A lot of people get Botox injections for uh, for sacri sacroiliac, you know, back pain or something like that. And the the doctor or the, the underwriters want to know, well, why are they why are they putting Botox in their back? And. It doesn't really say it just says Botox injections or something. Then, you, you know, you may have to explain that uh, further along what it is. And remember that those discovered medical questions or, or information could require additional medical requirements. I told you up front, Mr. Customer, that your policy wasn't going to require an exam. But based on what we've uncovered, we're going to have to have a, a paramed come out and take your blood and uh, make sure you're still uh, healthy. Uh, and then that, that leads to managing the offer, right? If you set the stage up front. It's easy to come back and uh, to, to 
Sam's point, hey, I told you it was going to be table D and you actually got table B. You did two steps better, right? Hey, I told you it was going to be non-tobacco preferred and you got non-tobacco preferred plus, right? So that's kind of managing that offer. Hey, you know, when I've got a negative, and it, when it's worse than what I illustrated, I tell them great news. We got an offer. It's not as good as what I thought it was going to be, but we still got an offer, man. Wrap that up. Any questions from you guys? We're right on the hour. Yes, Mr. Warren, I have a question. Yes. So when we fill out the cover sheet, um, like we had a special case maybe like two weeks ago that we submitted, and um, there were some specific health issues that he had going on. So we put that on the cover sheet, but then I also sent it to the underwriter once we received the initial welcome email. Should I do that twice, or will the cover sheet just suffice once I, I put that on there? Brad? So, so in theory, the cover sheet would suffice if you okay. if it's material enough medical information. I get it as early as you can in front of the underwriter, and the biggest reason why is you can you can eliminate some delays, right? Of course. It, it, so so it, especially those underwriters, a lot of those a lot of these underwriters, especially with you guys, we're working with the same ones, so mm -hmm. they get familiar with. Oh, by the way, we're trying to be proactive. We're trying to tell you up front. Resending it to the to the uh, underwriter is is not out of bounds at all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can also if, if you've got if if you've ran it up the flagpole through Brad, in in and and he's gotten you uh hey we're gonna rate this at table uh, D or whatever, you can put that uh we had uh, we we rated or we illustrated at table D per per whatever Brad tell whoever the person that that gave you the that information. Okay. Perfect. We'll Otherwise, do, they're going to go down their own path without right. connecting the dots. That makes right. sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Thoughts?